RCR Wireless News. My name is Sean Kinney, and we're here at the TC3 event in Mountain View, California, to talk with Samir Bichet of Ice Wireless and Steve Papa from Parallel Wireless about a pretty interesting project that you guys undertook in Canada to really bring connectivity to the unconnected. So, Samir, could you maybe tell us a little bit about the coverage area that you were looking to serve here and some of the challenges that came with that? Yeah, so uh, Canada is a very big country, as, as you already know, um, and we were trying to fix two issues. One is a distance divide and a digital divide. And the uh, landmass that we're talking about is basically all the three territories in northern Canada, the Arctic, and uh, northern Quebec as well. There's communities there that, uh, that we have licensed spectrum in. So uh, from a coverage perspective, it's, it's a vast amount, and we were looking at different solutions to basically help us reach that goal, which at first seems like a Herculean feat, right? And Steve, tell us about some of these solutions that have uh, been deployed in the Arctic region in Canada to uh, help with ICE Wireless's goal of getting that coverage in place. So, so at Parallel Wireless, our mission is to make what has historically been very complex and expensive cellular approach the simplicity and cost effectiveness of Wi-Fi, okay? So what we've done is try to use software to automate a lot of things that were manually done before, collapse aspects of the architecture, and then reduce the hardware footprint to the absolute minimum, like when you think of Wi-Fi access points, right? You know, people often forget every bit of hardware footprint means I got to cool it, I got to mount it, I have wind loading, I have people hauling it around, right? If I have to repair it, I got to haul it around. It's all that kind of stuff. And in fact, I think it'd be interesting, Samer, to talk about how people go about building these sites in such remote places. Yeah, so uh, this is not rural Ontario or rural Vermont. This is the Arctic, right? And the only modes of transportation is by plane most of the time, or sometimes, I don't know if you ever watched the uh, ice truck, uh, the Discovery <laughs> ice Channel. Truck truckers, ice yeah. truck, exactly. So, uh, it's kind of that you know environment that we're working with. So we have um, logistical nightmares. We have uh, permafrost issues. Uh, we got um, uh, you know if you miss one part, for example, you need to wait another week. If there's a blizzard before something will come into the community. And so the, what we were looking for is something that's scalable, cost-effective, and rugged. And actually, after researching quite a bit on different suppliers and you know just solutions out there we came across parallel wireless and Steve uh, was very um, you know sometimes talk to an equipment vendor and then they're selling you the moon right back Steve was very uh, knowledgeable and he was very precise about what can and cannot be done and in this case it was all can do's and uh, the uh, the deployment that we did right now on towers are you know we've, we've used um, uh, macro sites so traditional macro deployments but we're we're focusing more on the uh, pico type of deployments where we're using more rooftops because it's hard to put in an arctic you know a hundred foot tower for example well, any energy consumption and there's yeah. energy issues there's uh you know obviously heating is a big problem cooling is not a problem but heating is a big problem um serv serviceability i mean in, in minus 50 celsius which is what about six minus 60 fahrenheit or something you're, you have oil that freezes helicopters can't fly right so you have a, a like a slew of problems that unless it's simplified as steve mentioned like a wi-fi approach it's just not going to work. Yeah, every incremental you know? connection when you're in those kind of temperatures, right, makes it that much harder to service something and stuff like that. But you had, I mean, you were, and also the size of the system, being able to take it out on snow machines and whatnot. Oh, it's compact. I mean, these things right. are literally, yeah. I, I caught up with your team at Mobile World Congress and actually picked up one uh -huh. of the units. Uh -huh. and so, yeah, the size is a huge driver. But um, tell us a little bit more about the infrastructure involved here. I think you used your VRAN solution, your headnet gateway, and a base station. Well, actually, these are, I mean, most of these are satellite served, right? Most of, these Most of these communities, yeah. So one thing I want to uh, highlight is the fact that it's not one single approach to fix the problem. Eastern Arctic is completely different than Western Arctic. So there's not like a monolithic type solution that will say, oh, this is it, you know, we fix it. So uh, Eastern Arctic is all satellite based. Western Arctic, we got some microwave and some fiber there. Um, 
once again, the solution has to work as a ubiquitous type network. Because I mean, an ICE wireless customer in the West shouldn't experience anything different than well, the East. Well, nor do you want a very different set of technologies for simplification on the East and the West. Exactly. Right? You want one exactly. thing, one size fits all in this case. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, put, putting that all together, it was it was a perfect solution. Virtualized in, in the environment, we we had a, a Cisco integration as well on the EPC side, uh, and HetNet really is working the way it's supposed I to. I mean, it's worth calling out Cisco played a big role in actually bringing us together, right? Because they recognize that this would really help what you were trying to do. Absolutely. So yeah. So what's the response been like from your uh, your customers? Uh, response has been great. Uh, we're uh, you know, we're rolling it out now across all the communities. Uh, the experience is, is, is good. If anything, we're having issues more on the satellite backhaul than, you know, the last mile is not the issue anymore, which I actually thought the other way would have been, you know, like usually the last mile in these conditions is, you know, problematic. But uh, with uh, I, with um, parallel wireless solution, it's it's been great. And Samir, you mentioned that uh, going forward, you're looking at uh, a few other satellite type projects. Can you give us any uh, details of that? Yeah. So I've uh, co-founded a company called Kepler Communications. It's a nano satellite constellation, KU band telecommunications satellite that we're launching the first one in December of 2017. Um, and uh, the idea is to basically help bridge that distance and digital divide as well. Initially with the one satellite it's going to be, so these are five kilogram satellites, you know, 30 by 10 by 10, so size of a football basically. Um, and the whole idea is to, we, we want to be able to converge that digital and distance divide to, to be simplified process as as a Wi-Fi network if we, if we could. So a lot of shoe boxes in the sky. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so further to this point of, of connecting the unconnected and bridging the digital divide, Steve, what's uh, Parallel Wireless prioritizing for 2018 to further that? Well, actually, we made an announcement um, earlier this week uh, announcing the availability of our 2G solution. So that might sound like, why are you doing 2G? That's 20, you know, 20 years old. Turns out it plays a big role in connecting the disconnected, right? It goes further. There's still you know, billions of people without connectivity, and that extra distance from 2G complementing a 4G network can be really helpful. So it's stuff like that. It's really just finishing off those pieces, and sometimes that means going back in time. Yeah, you know, and this is a really important mega trend, I think, this idea that there's three and a half billion people on Earth that don't have reliable access mm -hmm. to broadband. What's the long view once these people get connected? What do you think that's going to do to the global community? Uh, you know, I, I th my greatest hope would be that, you know, education, right? Education brings more knowledge work, it grows economies, right? That would be uh, what I'd like to see. It brings smarter farming, which means more food. You know, it brings better health care. Right? Knowledge is, is, you know, is power. Right? We're, we're transforming communities by doing what we're doing. Rural wireless is actually the driver behind not just bridging the digital divide, but you're transforming an entire community from the dark ages to, once again, this is not rural Ontario, right? This is the Arctic, and from my perspective, you know, it's helping kids get an, an education now. It's helping people get proper health care, Medicare, you know, telehealth. There's so many applications that we're doing that we're really transforming communities from dark ages to civilization. And, and for a lot of communities, some of them, it allows them to participate in the global marketplace, right? I mean, some of the really remote ones, there's still logistics issues to work through, but, you know, I think, you know, so many of these very remote places have just been suppliers to many layers of distribution, right? If you look like the coffee growers and whatnot, most of the economic rewards don't go to them. This is their opportunity to participate in a greater way in the global economy. Well, gentlemen, I really appreciate you taking the time to share your perspectives on this important topic. Great. Okay, thank, thank you. you.